whichever way we're going, uh, uh, it yeah. be one way or the other. Okay. Oh, I'll I'll use a microphone. Yeah, yeah. How sure. does that sound? Well, let me see if there's a switch on it. That looks good. Um, <laughs> Check it. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm Herb Deutsch, and um, uh, you uh, saw in the movie that actually Bob and I were the sort of the whole beginning of where the Moog synthesizer would be right from the very beginning and then. That's enough of an introduction, Will. I'm sure there'll be questions. Um, hey, I'm Paul Miller, DJ Spooky, and um, I just got off a plane from Chicago, so I'm kind of just literally haven't even dropped my bags yet. So um, I'm a huge fan of Moog, and I think he's been highly, if not one of the most influential people um, in the music scene for you know, the late 20th century. There's a lot of history that goes into um, how you can think about what he's up to, and we'll get into that. But um, the idea is making tools for artists to use is something that's really important to think about when you're, you know, kind of working a riff on this. I'm Miguelian Graham's Moog, and I actually came because I wanted to say hello to Herb and DJ, but here I am. <laughs> <laughs> I was married to Bob for the last uh, 11 years of his life. Thanks, guys. So, uh, anybody? Pretty informal. Just uh, anybody have any questions? Thanks for jumping off a plane to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's a funny thing because um, when they had mentioned that me and her would be doing a dialogue and that uh, she would also be coming, I was really impressed and respectful of the history. And as a record collector, it's like um, one of the things I really think about a lot is the, the archive. You know, your records are something that you dig into and you have a lot of memories relating to. And if you think about how many records I have that have his keyboards on them in one capacity or another, you know, it was kind of like you get a, a chance to think about that when, um, when they went to do the introduction. And what, what, what comes into mind is when he came to my studio in New York, uh, I was just going back and forth and showing him different updates of what some of the stuff that has inherited from his, his inventions. And, um, you know, like right now, say for example, I have the, the Moog iPhone app and I have the DJ Spooky iPhone app. You can, you can mix them back and forth if you want. Um, but I love the fact that it's like, you know, you can just, uh, uh, many of the tools of a different era, I'll just show you a funny thing for a second. Um, you know, like, it's, if, if the, you know, and it's exactly like Tony. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so I can DJ from my phone. I don't need to carry. This. I don't need to carry this around that much anymore. But everything keeps evolving, and I think Bob really got that. That's my little take on it. I think but, that's absolutely true. I think one of the the things that. Um, contributed to Bob's success was that he, he very much loved analog uh, design and he loved the analog sound, but he had no illusions that, that he either could or would freeze um, the development of, of all the things that are going on or that it would be a good thing. Uh, he, he knew things were, were coming along that were going to be just as exciting and that were going to be just as musically innovative. and. Uh, and he looked forward to that. But you know what's great, and this is maybe something you could talk about, is the, the relationship between digital media and analog media. It's, in fact, analog is usually more complex. Um, and digital media is some kind of simplification into algorithms, into mathematical stuff that analog material is actually a lot more richer. Say, for example, if you drop the needle on vinyl, um, you actually get a lot more complexity of signal, and that's why you have a warmer sound, whereas a lot of digital media, you're losing a lot of frequencies, you're getting into compression. Um, so there's a kind of a, an arc of how people hear sound that's been happening in the last 20, 30 years as things get more and more digital. Our generation's probably grown up hearing CDs and more digital recordings, but I think what Bob was making these keyboards for was both a live experience and something that was a tool that uh, would enhance and or simulate the notion of what a keyboard was. So once that becomes software, again, you kind of, you, you lose certain things, but you also gain other things. When, um, and when I, when I uh, hear Paul speak of my generation, and then I think of my generation, and, and um, uh, I, 
in my, my generation was uh, was very different. And my thoughts when I when I first met, met Bob were I wanted to see all of the arts combine. Art is and, and expression are one thing, and there is and so much what Bob was talking about as a kind of a uh, there is a kind of a, a, an overall mystique that that you want to capture. And I was I, at that time. Uh, had no, I, where I felt is that I wanted to see, feel, and experience everything that I, that I wanted to say as an artist, because it was like really a way of saying what all experience is. And, and that's why meeting Bob, and of course, real, through, through the theremin, which is where we met, uh, through, uh, because I built one of those theremins of his, and that, that's where we met, and, and it, um, well, I don't know. That, 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 whole, that whole thing was, was, I think, in many ways spoken about. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really, uh, very pleased today to meet Paul uh, because I, I've heard so much about his writings and, and some things that he's been involved with. And so, anyway, that, uh, that's all I have to say at this point. But, I mean, you guys are pioneers in a way that you can think of scientists of sound, right? Yeah. You know, so say, for example, Leonid Thurman, the guy who invented Thurman, this, the Russians thought it would be a secret weapon, and they actually... Yeah. Abducted him from the yeah, streets of yeah, uh, was it New York? He, he was he he was amazingly supported by the Russians because in 1920, when he comes comes up with this totally new instrument, Lenin had literally taken over this. You know, in 1917, the Russians had this revolution, and there was a whole new government, and they saw they saw Theremin as a person who represented the new government the new idea of thinking that the Russians thought was great and supported it. And, and by, in fact, I, I'm sure you, you know, many, many of you might be interested in that um, Theremin actually taught Lenin how to play a piece of music on the Theremin. Mm -hmm. He taught him how to play the swan. <laughs> <laughs> no, but imagine, I mean, at that time, they, they considered it a top secret weapon and he defected. No, that's not quite no? right. Okay. No. Um, Thurman was Bob's hero, and um, and so so I'd, li I'd like to, to spend a moment or two, partly in Bob's honor, uh, talking about him. Thurman was certainly as great an inventor as Edison uh, or Tesla, perhaps greater. Um, and he was kidnapped not because the Thurman specifically was a weapon, but because the KGB kept for a while, um, I think there was more than one, but there was at least one essentially slave city in Siberia, Mogadan, where um, scientists uh, essentially lived not so bad lives compared to the rest of the Soviet citizens, but they were unable to leave and they did science for the KGB. And Theremin was a slave scientist for a number of years. Um, so it was his general brilliance rather than his specific fascination with music. But Theremin himself had been a very good cello player, and he was interested in electronic music because of his love of music. No, I mean, what, what I love about that is the Soviets had this specific military industrial complex, and they felt that this is something that we need to focus on in a way that the U.S., I mean, we have like Los Alamos, we have, you know, but so I guess maybe they're not slaves, but they all have to pay their credit card bills. So, you know, um, you know, it's just their, their sharecropping, you know. But, um, you know, when we think about the 20th century and the arms race and the Cold War, so music was a component of that and culture was a component of it. The CIA sponsored a lot of gallery shows. People all, you know, when the Soviets sent Sputnik in space, you know, it was a huge deal, and the U.S. said, all right, we got to get to the moon, you know. So people were really, so Bob's music and the, the keyboards, I think, were always a reflection of the time. They're, they're, you know, there was like this fascination with technology and the possibility that anything, you know, why not play the move on the moon? Or like, in fact, you know, Pink Floyd already did it, right? So um, <laughs> we can always imagine that it was very new.